Good morning. Good to see you all here. We have come into God's house and gathered in His name to worship Him. So I encourage you, let's forget about ourselves for just a little while and concentrate on Him and worship Christ the Lord. Gathered together then, standing together, let us sing praises to His name, Living for Jesus, hymn 605.
Would you bow with us as we pray together? Oh Lord, today we do thank you that we not only are living for you, but we live and serve a risen Savior. Lord, we just thank you for that fact today. And as we gather together in this place, Lord, we just pray that you would forgive us of our sins and our transgressions, all of the things, Father, that stand between us and you, things that we regret in our lives because they are things that are sins against you. Lord, as the, uh, as the old great King David said, I have not sinned against others, but it's against you and you alone, O oh God, that I've sinned. So we pray for forgiveness for that and restoration and reconciliation in these moments that we might hear from your Spirit and be fed through and by the power and the presence of your Spirit in these moments as we share this time together. Lord, we pray today that you would take charge of this service, that needs would be met, lives would be changed and uplifted, and that we would be drawn closer and nearer to you in all of the things that we do each and every day of our lives. Lord, we just pray now for this service, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, good morning again. We're glad that you're here this morning and we welcome you to this service of worship. And if you visit with us this morning, you are not just a visitor, but you're our welcome guest. And we want you to know that. And we're glad that you're here. And give us an opportunity this morning to, uh, during our time of fellowship and uh, during and after the service, an opportunity to get to know you better. If you uh, are a visitor for the first time, or if it's the first time in a long time that you've been, if you would look there in the pew pocket in front of you and uh, reach in and get a, a visitor's card, and if you would fill that out and leave that in the offering plate as it goes by, and that'll give us a record of your visit here today, and we would very much appreciate that. Uh, our folks, if you've not had time to speak to our visitors today, this is a good time to do that during our praise and fellowship time and our uh, as we uh, begin that now and uh, I'm going to ask Brother Sean if he would to come and lead us and as Miss Lara begins to play, uh, to play and we sing uh, our opening praise hymn uh, during that fellowship time I ask you to, to greet our, our visitors and each other uh, in that time. Brother Sean would you come and, and lead us? Let us stand once again. I am blessed. said I am the light of the world and because of that as his people his elect in, in his own name we can be the light in this darkened world as well so put on your light let it shine hide it under a bushel no let's sing got the tambourine again.
I'll tell you, that's sometimes a, a difficult task, isn't it? When the world is going on around you and you're falling behind, but you just pray. Because this song is a prayer. Lead, lead me, Lord. Lead us, Lord.
Lord, we just lift all of this up and commit it to you, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. As our praise team comes down, uh, just a few things to come to our attention. Uh, one of the things is uh, our nursery workers. We are still in need of nursery workers, so uh, if you would be willing to help us, we would appreciate it. Uh, if not, we're coming after you. We've already decided. I just want to say thank you to everyone who said yes to me today. Yes. Thank you for coming. Yes. Thank you for coming. 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 Responsibility. It's an important responsibility, and we're we are so appreciative of those who do volunteer uh, back there. There are many other announcements in our bulletin this morning, and you can see those. Are there are there some that need specifically to come to our attention, other than what's on the printed page? Just want to remind you that Wednesday night supper will be coming up this week. The birthday party up at the home is this week as well at the nursing home. And business meeting is Wednesday night. Those are three big happenings coming right up here in the early part of the week. Not then, Brother Sean, to do this. Our offertory hymn this morning, Here I Am, Lord. Here I Am, hymn number 589. <laughs>
to thank you again for this day. Without the students, we have to come to the house to hear your work and sing. Father, we do thank you for the cold that you give us, Lord, for the rain that you give us, and again now, warm weather you give us. And Father, for the opportunity we have to come to your house to hear your work, Father, we thank you for that. And as we come to this portion of the service, Lord, Help us to give back the portion that you blessed us with, that your word might be lifted and carried on to the glory of the Father. We ask these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. children's worship group is going out now with Miss Mildred and uh, Miss Shirley standing in the back and so everybody's uh, headed that way and truly as we think about the message of that song it is no secret what God can do 
And you know, if it is a secret, we're not doing our job. Amen. Occurs to me that that's the truth too. Jonah is our reading today. Jonah, the chapter, first chapter, verses one through three. Jonah's a little book. He was considered a minor prophet. But you know what? He had a major revival on his hands before it got all over with. Of course, I don't want to give the story away. We'll stop right there. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The scripture reads, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of, the son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went up down to, or went down to Joppa, uh, where he found a, a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Will you bow with me as we pray together? Lord, in these moments, we just um, we come to you and we give this to you as a living sacrifice. Lord, these are your moments. We are your people. This is not my time, nor theirs. It is yours to be with us, to share with us, to nurture us, and to teach us, to admonish us. Oh God, I pray that your spirit would speak loudly and clearly today to your people. Feed us, O oh Lord, in our frailties, in our weaknesses, in our inabilities to measure up. We thank you for Jesus Christ, who brings us back into reconciliation with you. Speak now, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. For a few Sundays, I want us to take a look at this life of, uh, uh, of the man in this book, uh, the life that's recorded there of the prophet Jonah. Uh, this book, uh, the message of the book of Jonah is that Yahweh, the one true and living God, is an all-powerful and all-sovereign God and that he is still in charge no matter where we are. And he still is in the business of bestowing his grace on whomever he desires. And that's good news for you and me, because you and I do not deserve God's grace. But you know what? He chose anyway to bestow that grace upon us through Jesus Christ if we move up and accept him. Well, in other words, God is a God of second chances. He gives second opportunities. And I want you to look at the great things, and we want to look at the great things together in the book of Jonah that came from the messes that we as humans make. And yet when we begin serving God, when we give that all over to him, what miracles he can make out of our messes. And today we begin right off the bat finding Jonah doing something that I expect on occasion we've all done, and that is running from God. I don't want a second chance, Lord. I don't want to do what you've called me to do. I don't want to be who you've called me to be. I just want you to leave me alone and let me do my own thing. I wonder this morning, have you ever just wanted to run away? I suspect you, like me, have that feeling once in a while. You just want to get away. We want to just get uh, uh, away from everything that plagues us, all the things that are around us. We just want to run. So today we find Jonah attempting, attempting to run away from God. Now, of all of the supernatural occurrences that are recorded in the Bible, probably, and, and uh, this is, uh, this is the, 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 what is it they say, the, uh, the monkey in the room that we need to get off of, uh, we get, need to get rid of while we are fresh and new in the book of Jonah. But uh, probably none has received much, as much scorn or as much ridicule as the book of Jonah has. But I want to talk just a moment about the credibility of this book and the minor prophet that it represents. To a great many liberal scholars and skeptics, the account 
of Jonah the whale is really only a, a Jonah and the whale, so to speak, is really only a story that's fit for children and not serious thinkers. That this whole idea is a myth. Well, let's get beyond that. It kind of reminds me of the story, as a matter of fact, uh, that I heard about a little girl in elementary school who <clears throat> was in class one day and they were studying in science about the oceans. And the teacher simply told the class, she said, I don't want you to ever be afraid of going into the sea because there is nothing in the sea. There are no sea creatures that are going to swallow you whole. So this little girl raised her hand and she said, well, I learned in church yesterday that a great fish swallowed Jonah whole. And the teacher kind of sneered and scoffed at that, and she said, well, that's impossible. That could never happen. And the little girl said back to the teacher, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah. Well, the teacher kind of sneered again, and she said, well, if Jonah didn't go to heaven, then what are you going to do? And the little girl said, well, if he didn't go to heaven, then you can ask him. <laughs> well, that's an, probably an oversimplification. That one kind of catches you off guard, doesn't it? <laughs> well, that's an oversimplification uh, and an oversimplified uh, story for a very complex issue. This whole issue is a very complex issue, and the fact is that there are only three verses in the entire book of Jonah that deal with this story of the great fish. And if it's the story of the the story itself is a, one of someone who very much like ourselves, very much like you and I, have issues and problems. There are struggles in the life of Jonah. Anyone here ever had struggles in your life? There are there are problems with God's calling upon Jonah. Jonah has problems with being disobedient and sinful before God. There are problems of prayer and how Jonah prays to God. But most of all, this whole entire story this morning is a story about second chances. Now I want to repeat that again. This story is a story about second chances. I wonder this morning, do you need a second chance in your life? Have you ever needed a second chance? We call it a do-over. Do you need a do-over in your life this morning? Well, let me start right off the cuff by saying get over the fish business. We're, we're going to put that behind us and move forward. Because Jonah, historically, is an accurate portrayal of the life of this prophet. It's a very short portrayal, but it's a very powerful message. And the great fish is only one little minute piece of it. So let's get beyond that and move on to this historically accurate uh, life in the, in the life of the prophet Jonah. And the main reason that we know that Jonah is historically accurate is because Jesus accepted it as historically accurate. As a matter of fact, uh, when the unbelieving scribes and Pharisees confronted Jesus uh, and said to him, we want a sign that you are who you say you are, that these things are going to happen in Matthew the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 39 through 40. Uh, Matthew records Jesus as saying, and he answered, A wicked and ambitious generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You see, Jesus used the book of Jonah himself as historically accurate, and he used it as a historically accurate illustration about his own literal, physical resurrection. So if therefore we are going to reject the historical accuracy of the book of Jonah, then we have to call into question along with that the integrity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So that once and for all settles the accuracy, the historical accuracy and the validity and the credibility of this book of Jonah. So I want us to think just a moment about what he's saying here in these first verses. First of all, God is still inviting us. God is still 
calling us to join him in his work. Look there in verse 1, part A. Now the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, I don't know how the Lord spoke to Jonah. He may have spoken to him audibly, a lot like he did to Adam and to Abraham. Uh, he might have spoken to him in a vision, a lot like he did to Ezekiel. Or he might have spoken to him in a dream, a lot like he did Joseph. And we have just finished uh, talking about that as the Christmas story uh, is, uh, is still fresh in our minds. Uh, but we may, uh, he may have simply left an impression, and, and that indelible uh, uh, impression that, uh, that Jonah just simply could not get rid of, much like he speaks to us today when God puts something on your heart and God puts something on your mind, and it just stays there, and it stays there, and you try to forget it, and you try to get rid of it, and it stays there, and it won't go away, and you know, you know as a child of God in Christ Jesus that it is God's Spirit who has laid that thing on your heart and that he's not going to go away until you do something about it. Well, we don't know how God chose to speak to Jonah, but we do know that he did. And the point that I want us to see is, is that God is still speaking to us today. He's still laying things on our heart. He's still calling us. And you know what? The further you get away from him, the, the smaller his voice is going to be. When I was a child, if I didn't want my mama to find me or interrupt what I was doing in that moment, I would find the farthest place I could away from her in order to do it so that when she hollered my name out that door, I wouldn't be able to hear her. Or if I did hear her, I could think to myself, well, that must be the rooster crow and that can't be my mama. And I would just go on doing what I was doing instead of coming to do what she called me to do. Well, today the Lord is still calling us and we, he is still inviting us to become a part of his work and it is, is as intense, as important, and as necessary as it was 3,000 years ago when he called Jonah to Nineveh. God is still, is still speaking to us and he is inviting us to join him in his work. And I want to ask you this morning... Have you moved so far away from him? Have you put him far enough away on a back burner that the voice that he's using to call you has just kind of faded off into the distance? There is just something there. The Holy Spirit doesn't let it go, but it's far enough away that you can, with some regularity, go about your daily life and it doesn't bother you too much. If that's the case... You've got work to do. You need to turn around and head back away from Tarshish. Well, secondly, God still speaks to us, but sometimes we don't like what he tells us to do. Sometimes we just simply don't want to do it. If you look there in verse 2, verse 2 he said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, in the Living Bible there is a paraphrase of that. You know, the Living Bible is a paraphrase, basically, of the original, actually it's a paraphrase of the King James Version. Back in the early 70s they took King James and paraphrased it uh, and used some of the original manuscripts to help them do that. Their paraphrase of that is, the wickedness of Nineveh was such that it smelled to high heaven. It was so bad in the city of Nineveh that it stunk in the nostrils of Almighty God in heaven. He could barely stand it because it was so bad. That's the, that's the intensity of what's being said here in this scripture. The wickedness has come up before me, God said to Jonah about the city of Nineveh. And God called Jonah to take a message of judgment to Nineveh. We were talking this morning in Sunday school about, uh, about sharing with people that, um, who have, are lost, who have never made a profession of faith what their destiny is when they leave this world. If you have not ever made a profession of faith and your destiny is not heaven, it is eternal hell. And how we seem to be a little bit afraid of that. We don't want to talk too much about it. Well, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh and he didn't want to judge those people according to God's word and say, you are in jeopardy. God is going to, to annihilate you if you don't get straightened out with him. If you don't turn from your wicked ways. And Jonah didn't want any part of that. He didn't want to go do that. Nineveh was an up and coming world power. 
for about 50 years now, Nineveh had, had been working at become, uh, becoming one of the greatest centers uh, on earth. It was a place of, it was a cultural center. It was an economic center. It was a warfare. It was a, uh, had one of the greatest armies. The Assyrian army was headquartered at Nineveh. It was a great city. It was a powerful city. It wielded much influence in the Middle East, perhaps maybe some of the greatest in the world. It was located right on the beautiful and majestic Tigris River where uh, the, that beautiful Tigris River flowed and no doubt there were homes along there. And if you look now and you see pictures in Iraq, I, I don't know what it looks like now, but a, a number of years ago you could see pictures of homes <laughs> along that Tigris River. That is a beautiful place. And Nineveh was there and they were living it up. There were more than 600,000 people, a megalopolis of that time at Nineveh. But God was about to annihilate that city because he was fed up. He was tired of their sinful ways and their wickedness uh, and what they were doing. And he had called Jonah to go and tell them what he was going to do, to carry to them his judgment. And this is the last place on earth that he thought God would ever send him. Have you ever felt that way? Lord, I don't want to go there. That's the last place on earth that I want to go. And I certainly don't want you to send me there. There are missionaries today that we support with our Lottie Moon Christmas offering who are in places that are Muslim strongholds and hotbeds so in so much danger that their names cannot be put in print for us to read because God has called them to a place that he, they thought he would never call them to, but they didn't rest until they went. And then we wonder sometimes why God calls us to do some of the things he does and say, Lord, I don't want to do that. I just don't want to do that. Well, God had called Jonah to an Assyrian empire, a place where they kept their prisoners alive and they gloated over their victims and they enjoyed their atrocities. And they would hold down their victims and cut out their tongues they would skin them alive, literally, and nail their hides to a post. They built pyramids of human skulls outside of the gates of the cities that they would conquer. Their cruelty was known throughout the world, and they did not hold anything in reserve. And Jonah hated these people, and he was angry with God. Have you ever been angry with God? God, I just don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Don't make me do it. In verse 4, chapter 2, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah says, and the scripture says, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. And he said, and he prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said? Didn't I tell you so when I was still at home? This is what I was so quick to, why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. Not only was Jonah scared, angry right there, but he was scared. Have you been scared and angry at the same time? about something you had to do, and that's where Jonah was. And he said, God, I told you this. I told you this was going to happen, Lord. I told you that they were this kind of people. And now I'm here in the middle of it. And what am I doing here, Lord? What am I doing here? God still speaks to us, but sometimes we just don't want to do what he asks us to do, what he calls us to do. We just don't want to do it. And we just flat don't do it. We just say, no, Lord, I'm not going to do it. Shame on us. That's the only thing I know to say there. Well, third, going away from God is always going in the wrong direction. Chapter 3, verse 8, part A. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Now that was in the opposite direction. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship that was bound uh, for that port, and that's where he got on, and that's where he headed. Now verse 3 begins with two of the saddest words I think you can say to God. But God. But God. Have you ever done that? Do you do it all the time? Are there occasions when you do it? When God calls you out to do something? When God says, I don't care how old you are. I don't care how sick you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how busy you are. 
This is a task I have for you to do. And you go, but God, but God. Instead of being thankful and settling out to serve God, Jonah decided to go in the other direction and run. And Jonah made a conscious decision not to heed the call of God. Nineveh, you see, was in the east, and Tarshish was in the west. And Tarshish is believed by some archaeologists to be uh, over in southern Spain, and if that's the case, and very likely it is, that destination was more than 2,000 miles away from Nineveh. Now, he was trying to get out of earshot of God, wasn't he? the best he possibly could. He was trying to get out of the way when God called him again and say, go to Nineveh, because God had given him a free will, just like he gives to you and I. He chose, he chose, you and I get to choose, we can choose. He chose to go where he wanted to go, not where God wanted him to. But going away from God is always in a bad direction. It's always in the wrong direction. And my greatest fear is that we as a nation are going to find that out the hard way. My greatest fear is that we as individuals maybe are going to find that out the hard way. That, that going in the wrong direction, going in the opposite direction, that God is calling us to go is a bad way to go. It's the wrong direction. Well, fourth, running away from God is always a downward spiral. In verse 3, the second part of that verse, in, in part C actually of verse 3, after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Well, some may argue the point that any path that you go away from God leads downhill. But once we step on the path of disobedience, once we say no, once we say, but God, but God, I just, I can't do that. And we head out in the other direction and we seek to hide from the will of God and get away from it as far as we possibly can. And you see, <clears throat> Jonah left and, and, and went to, uh, to uh, 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 went all the way in a different direction uh, from going to Nineveh. He left and went to Tarshish instead of to Nineveh. But you see, you and I don't have to do that. All we have to do is quit coming to church. All we have to do is uh, go to places where we know the name of God is not going to be mentioned. We have to hang out with people who don't want to hear anything about God, that all they want to do is study worldly kinds of things, and, and they're not interested in the will of God, and they don't want you to bother them with it. That's a comfortable place to be. Fairly comfortable. God's not going to leave you alone, but at least you're getting further away from him. Or, or don't serve. Get in a place where you don't have to serve. You don't have to be a part of what's going on in the church. Maybe just show up, run in, and run out. And that's a form of running, by the way. But I want you to note that that was a downward spiral every step of the way. The King James Version, the New King James Version, every one of those is down, down, down down. King James Version said he went down to Joppa, verse 3. He went down into the ship, verse 3. He went down in sleep, verse 5. Sometimes someone will leave serving the Lord for a life of sin just to get away, just to get out of earshot, just to hide so that God can't reach them. How happy I am. How contented I am. I'm away. I'm doing my own thing. I'm having my own pleasure. I'm, I'm living a life of, but God, but God, I just don't want to do that. But ultimately we find out that our ship has already sailed. It sailed on time. And if we're headed for Tarshish when God has called us to Nineveh, then we're sailing into a storm. We're sailing into a storm. Dr. Donald Barnhouse says this, when you run away from the Lord, you never, and this is true, if you've never lived through this, if this is not a personal testimony and you're running from the Lord, it will be. It will be. When you run away from the Lord, Barnhouse says, you never get where you're going. You always pay your own fare. But when you go the Lord's way, 
You always get where you're going, and he pays the way. That is the truth. That is the truth. Maybe this morning you're running from the Lord. Maybe he's calling you to him. Maybe you've never come to him through and by the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And his spirit is calling you this morning. And once again, while that spirit is convicting your heart, you're saying no. No, but Lord, no. This is not the day. I believe that there would have been a time in Jonah's life when there wouldn't have been any more chances. Today there was a second chance. You see, he gave Jonah a, check, a second chance. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in Sundays to come. But I believe there would have been a time when God cut Jonah off. He would have gone on and dealt with somebody who, else, who was more pliable, who was interested, who wanted to come, who wanted to do, who wanted to be a part of God's kingdom. Maybe God's calling you this morning, and one more time you're saying no. Today is your day of salvation. Maybe you need to come today. This may be your last opportunity. Or maybe God is calling you this morning to something. Maybe he's calling you to draw nearer. Maybe he's calling you to church membership. Maybe he is calling you to, uh, to get into a church family, to get to work in that church family, to bear the burdens that that church family has to bear, to be a part of what that church family is doing. Maybe he's calling you here this morning to do that. And you're saying, but Lord, but Lord, I just don't want to do that. I just want to come do my own thing and then go home and you leave me alone the rest of the week. That's all I want to do. But Lord, maybe you need to come and give your all to him this morning. Or maybe you need to come for church membership. Maybe he's calling you. As Brother Sean comes and Miss Linda and Mr. Norman, whatever your need is, I encourage you to come. Standing together, let us sing hymn number 593, Where He Leads Me. 593. <laughs> Yeah. 